Maiden Voyage here. Uh, the Oral History Project is taking place here at the American Society of Criminology meetings in 2011, and our first interview today is with uh, Robert J. Bursick, Jr., uh, who really was responsible for the, much of the resurgence in the social disorganization literature uh, most recently. Uh, before he became the criminologist that he is, uh, he started his undergraduate at the University of Rutgers in sociology, and then matriculated at the, for his PhD at the University of Chicago uh, in 1980, he earned his degree. Uh, while at the University of Chicago, he also had an appointment at the Institute for Juvenile Research from 1978 to 1983. That's, Char uh, that's Henry McKay's old spot. If, uh, yeah, both Charles McKay. Okay. And Saul Coburn and Jim Short was associated with it for a while. Uh, it, it had quite a heritage. <laughs> It must have been quite an experience. Uh, and then in 1983, you jumped over to the academic world uh, at the University of Oklahoma, where you held uh, a variety of positions from assistant professor all the way up to uh, chairing the Department of Sociology right. from 1993 to 96. While at the University of Oklahoma, you, you uh, uh, earned quite a bit of hardware in terms of uh, accolades and awards for your distinguished lectureship and excellence in teaching. Uh, part of which I, I, I uh, got the value of, and uh, TA, your, uh, your massive intro classes. Remember that well. <laughs> uh, and then in 1996, you uh, came to the University of Missouri at St. Louis, where you're now a uh, curator's professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, uh, dispensing with criminology like it ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't take credit for that. That's a phrase Rick Rosenfeld came up with. Oh, okay. I think it's, it's kind of catchy. But. Yeah, I think it is too. Uh, you've been engaged in a variety of scholarship. Um, I do want to pay deference to a little bit of scholarship that you've done in terms of uh, expanding on deter the deterrence literature, and you've also done quite a bit of testing uh, with uh, the self-control theory that, mm -hmm. that uh, was introduced in 1990 there uh, with the, the famous Bursic and Grasmic scale. But, uh, Technically, it's Grasmic and Bursic. So. Oh, <laughs> that's but good. I, I appreciate that. Uh, right. Uh, but I think you're most well known for uh, the variety of the neighborhood work that you did, uh, much of which, much of your earlier work uh, used uh, Sean McKay's old data. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a variety of publications like that. And then in 1988, I think it was a real splash with your criminology piece that, that talked about the problems and the prospects and really uh, evaluated the state of, of social disorganization. And I think right. it really set the table for uh, what became a watershed work in 1993 with Neighborhoods in Crime, the Dimensions of Effective Community Control with, with Harold Grasmick, which introduced the systemic model. Uh, also for purposes of, of the interview here, I think it's important to, to point out in 1988, you also had uh, a brief uh, piece in the criminologist called the premature encapsulation, <laughs> which introduced sort of the character behind and sort of the evolution yeah. of, of, of uh, your... A, a title, by the way, for which I caught a lot of grief. Oh, right. <laughs> it's kind of funny, it was written 20 years ago here, and it, it's, it's kind of interesting to see yeah. how your career unfolded and progressed from, from that point to this. Well, see, premature encapsulation was kind of a play on premature ejaculation. <laughs> and uh, not everybody picked up on that, and those that did weren't really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, you, uh, along the way, you've earned a variety of uh, honors and recognition. Uh, and, it's, and it's important to also note that you served as editor of Criminology, uh, mm -hmm. the, the flagship publication. From, from 1997 to 2003. Right. You've been recognized, you served as Vice President uh, of the American Society of Criminology in 1996 to 97, and in the subsequent year, 1998, you were an elected fellow. Right. And uh, this all culminated with your uh, ascendancy to the presidency of the ASC in 2008, which uh, a colorful, one of the more colorful uh, presidential uh, <laughs> uh, addresses with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the uh, State of Criminological Knowledge. Uh, Which was probably, I had more fun writing that than anything else I've ever done. It, it just, it fits with my own research interest and I, I think it's important because it fits in with uh, a growing trend within the field to, to take stock and reevaluate sure. where we're at. Uh, but before you became uh, Robert J. Bursick Jr. I've uh, never become Robert J. Bursick Jr. That well, was kind of in deference to my dad who was Robert J. Bursick, so. So just in deference to him, I, I would put the whole name in just Junior. Uh, but everybody knows me as Bob, so. What, 
how did you become Bob Bursick, <coughs> criminologist, from your uh, earlier days uh, in, in Omaha? Well, the, the evolution of how you came into the field uh, is kind of intriguing. Well, when, when I was growing up, uh, uh, my grandparents were immigrants, and Omaha was very much of a neighborhood uh, city, still is. And we, we didn't have a whole bunch of money, so the big family entertainment was we'd hop in the car. Uh, my dad was a traveling salesman, so we had a car. Yeah. And we'd drive around town. And these, the differences in the neighborhoods really fascinated me. And we spent a lot of time in uh, the, the Czech neighborhood, although it's, it was actually Bohemian. Okay. There's, there's a lot of different ethnicities uh, within the Czech Republic. Uh, mine was Bohemian. And that neighborhood was just outstanding. It was, you know, everybody talked Czech. Uh, there's the Sokol Hall. So, you know, on Saturday nights, there were the big polka parties <laughs> and food that I still love to this day, but makes people cringe because you can listen to your arteries clog. <laughs> and so neighborhoods always fascinated me. It was kind of like, like going on a big trip for free. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, I, I moved to, uh, right before my senior year of high school, my dad got moved to uh, New Jersey. So I moved out to New Jersey, which was the best thing that could happen to me because then I could go to Rutgers, uh, which is a state university. Right. A lot of people think it's, it's Ivy League, but no. It, it's Rutgers, the state university. Okay. It's the official title. And uh, I got a, just a hell of an education okay. at Rutgers. Uh, Originally, I wasn't sure if I wanted to major in psychology or sociology. All right. And then I took the baby psych course, and it was taught by this, this wonderful guy, but he was just certifiable, because <coughs> he had come from Harvard, and uh, I think he was a postdoc, I don't think he was on the faculty, but he, he was from Harvard, had spent part of his time as uh, uh, a research assistant for B.F. Skinner, and had spent the other part of his time at Harvard as a research assistant for Timothy Leary. Okay. So now we've got this Pavlonian psychologist who drops acid. And it, as a result, the, the class was interesting. On one day you'd get uh, schedules of reinforcement, very traditional kind okay. of lecture. And the next session he'd bring in this 40-page mimeograph handout on how to make hallucinogens out of your kitchen cabinet. <laughs> so. Uh, it was fascinating, and I loved the course, but I said maybe psychology wasn't for me. And, and it wasn't fair to base it on this guy. All right. But uh, I didn't think concentrated on, on social. And came under the wing eventually uh, of probably the, the, the first real mentor I ever had, a woman named Matilda White Riley, uh, sociologist. She does, uh, uh, she did aging research and she was, pretty well known, I realize after the fact, you never know why you're in college. Yeah. After the fact, I find out that Matilda really was a big dog in, in the area. And uh, she really encouraged me, and, uh, and it was through Matilda that uh, I decided uh, to go to grad school. Okay. Now at that time, but by my senior year, I was interested in skid row alcoholism. And uh, my senior project was, was kind of fun. Uh, for two months, I lived on the Bowery. I took a bus into the city. I had a dime strapped to my leg so I could call Matilda if I got in trouble I couldn't right. handle, and I had a return bus ticket. That was all I had to see if, see what I could do for two months. All right. And Well, I was the world's worst ethnographer. I was just <laughs> awful. But I had a great time because at this point, I had already, I, I, well, as you know, Brendan, I, I spent three seasons in a circus. Yeah. At this point, I had done that, and I had circus skills. All right. And the Bowery's not too far from Wall Street, so I would go to Wall Street every lunch hour and pound ice picks into my head for donations. And I couldn't make 50 bucks an hour. I was the most popular son of a bitch in the Bowery <laughs> because I, you know, I, I, could, I could cover the liquor. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it was a lot of fun. And at that time, that's also where I learned that much as I love ethnography, yeah. but I just, I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> you know, right. I, it's, it's, it's a skill I just don't have. I wish I did, but yeah. I just don't have. But I wanted to continue studying skid row alcoholism. 
And at that time, uh, one of the guys doing a lot of work with that was a guy named Don Bogue, mm -hmm. at, uh, Donald Bogue, at a University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Chicago, I uh, was lucky enough to get in, I got some support, and I got assigned to Don uh, as his research assistant. He had a center there called the Community uh, and Family Studies Center, which actually originally had been founded by Burgess, which I find out later huh. um, And one of the first things he, he did was sit me down and say, you know, Bob, deviance is fine. Your prospects in studying skid row alcoholism it, it, they're not existing, <laughs> you know. It's a little teeny niche. So through his encouragement, my, my focus then stayed in deviance, but shifted mm -hmm. towards uh, first delinquency and, and then criminology in general. Okay. Chicago being Chicago uh, and its tradition of, of neighborhoods. What I would do every, every Saturday, <clears throat> a friend of mine and I, uh, we blindfold one of us, throw a dart in the big map of Chicago. And wherever it landed, that's the neighborhood we had to spend that Saturday in. All right. And the ground rule was you had to eat one meal and go to at least two bars. And over the course of that first year there, I got to know Chicago really well. And so I, this, this neighborhood thing is percolating, percolating. Yeah. And then Don turned me on to Sean McKay, who I had never heard of before, uh, in, in college at least. And I, I picked up their, uh, uh, the 69 edition of uh, Juvenile Delinquency in Urban Areas. Huh. I was good. That was it. Uh, so I wanted to be a neighborhood criminologist. But I didn't know how to do that at first. Uh -huh. So my dissertation actually has nothing to do with neighborhoods. It's a dissertation on uh, uh, specialization in delinquency. Huh. So go figure. <laughs> But as I'm nearing, well, about halfway through the, the dissertation, and this opening shows up at uh, the Institute for Juvenile Research, All right. uh, which is where Sean McKay conducted, yeah. conducted work. And as I mentioned, you know, Saul Coburn had gone through there, and Jim Short had been associated with, uh, with it, and a whole bunch of other folks. Opening showed up there, and Don said, you know, Bob, this, this is your child. So I applied for it, I was lucky enough to get the job. So I went to work at IJR uh, before I, I finished the dissertation. My dissertation should have been, probably been done in 1978. <laughs> but you know, new job and, right. and uh, you folks from the future, if you're grad students, get your PhD done before you go because it takes a long time after you're working yeah. to get that done. And um, at IJR we're involved in a bunch of products projects. And one of my best buddies there, still a real close friend, a guy named Jim Webb, and I were in the base, we're, we're both pack rats, and we're in the basement of IJR, and we came across two great discoveries. First we found these cardboard boxes that had all of the life history Shaw collected. He only published three of them, yeah. uh, but there's about 125 more that, that were just sitting there. And they're, luckily, they've been salvaged. They're at, they're at the uh, Chicago Historical Museum now. That took a long time to track down mm. recently. But Jimmy tripped over something. And, and Jimmy being the, the kind of hot-blooded young man who was then, <laughs> after a barrage of like 30 words that make sailors cringe, we opened up this file cabinet he tripped over, and it was the original Sean McKay data. And that was just, just coolness personified. Yeah. So we got we got a dolly, drug them up to my office. So we spent a summer recoding those data, and uh, the first piece we published off of those data were, was I think 1982, mm -hmm. and that's that's where my, my neighborhood stuff started. So it was a real. I still have a real love of neighborhoods. Um, if I'm in a new city, for example. And if my wife isn't with me, <laughs> the first thing I do is open up the yellow pages and I see where the pawn shops are. Huh. And that's the first neighborhood I visit. <laughs> um, because it's, it's, it's old time character. Hmm. When I moved to Chicago, there were still burlesque houses and tattoo parlors, which were illegal at that time, but you all knew where they were. Uh, 
places where you could get shots and beers for 60 cents mm. on a breakfast special. <laughs> they called, they would always call it the businessman special. <laughs> it was good from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And uh, I, I just fell in love, love, love the city. Start out living in Hyde Park, which is down by the University of Chicago. End up moving uh, into the Taylor Street neighborhood, <coughs> where I spent five years, I guess. That's the neighborhood Jerry Settle studied in yeah. social order of the slum. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the original Little Italy in, in Chicago. So, so yeah. it's got a history of, uh, let's see how, how to put this, uh, activities that are somewhat outside the bound of, of conventional behavior. Okay. And uh, that was it. I, I, was, I was hooked on the neighborhood. Could, could you walk us through the progression of uh, Working from the old Sean McKay model, which you have a, a great, profound amount of respect for. Oh yeah, and, but you've managed to extend that in its own way. Okay. And, and well, I, it's interesting. Um, you know, I work at a department of criminology and criminal justice. Yes. And I, I love our department. I love the people we work with. I love our grad students. It's a, you know, this is where I'm, I'm going to retire. But the downside of it is when I was in grad school. And this is the same, you see this really reflected in, in Rob Sampson's work too. Yeah. There were very, very few CJ departments. Mm -hmm. just, just a handful at that time, because the LEAA thing was just starting to kick in. Yeah. So if you're gonna study CRIM, you had to do it through another discipline. Okay. And at that time, the other the discipline was sociology. Yeah. Uh, Rob, I think, Rob came up initially through sociology, I, and I certainly did. Yeah. <clears throat> when you're in that, that kind of a, a department, you can't just study crim. Yeah. In fact, Chicago didn't offer any criminology courses when I was there. Hmm. They offered one deviance course that Barry Schwartz taught, huh. uh, School of Social Work, that's where Sperga was, yeah. and Peg Rogan, Rosenheim was there. They taught a couple. At that time, uh, Frank Zimmering was in the law school. That's right. He would occasionally teach some. Okay. But you, you built your own crim program, so what you were left with for courses was in all the other fields of soaps. So you had to learn all about uh, contemporary developments, race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. and stratification, and comparative social, all kinds of stuff, including urban social. Mm -hmm. And there was some neat stuff going on in urban social at that time. Uh, uh, some of it coming out of Chicago. and. Um, the one that had a particular influence on me is, is what was called the systemic model of urban structure. Okay. And in sociology, some geographers had also uh, developed this. Huh. Uh, a guy named Brian Berry, who also used to be in Chicago, he's in Texas now. Huh. Uh, it's a model, it was uh, an anti-Louis Worth, Louis Worth model, where you know he, his model of the city was this seething mass of unconnected individuals who yeah. were anomic and so on and so forth. And this was kind of the counterpoint to it, because I didn't know Jack Casarda very well, but I knew Morris Janowitz well. Mm -hmm. Janowitz was a neighborhood guy. Yeah. And so he and Casarda uh, developed this model based on relational networks. And that showed, you know, sure, if you're first, the first time you move to a city, you don't know anybody. Yeah. You know, you feel alienated and you're mm -hmm. lost. And, and all your relationships are basically secondary. You know, somebody only because she's the cab driver. Okay. You know, somebody only because he's the cashier yeah. or he's only the bartender. But over time, the longer you live there, hmm. primary develop, uh, associations begin to okay. to develop. So that's in the back of my back okay. of my head. Independently, it, it's looking back on it. This, oh, and what's in the back of my head was the relevance of this for the Shaw McKay work yeah. because okay. one of their huge criticisms, uh, which was also a criticism of Thomas. W.I. Thomas, was that there was really no clear conceptualization of what you meant by disorganization. Um, many people thought disorganization was crime, you okay. know, so and it's tautological right. aspect. It's a very flimsy, and they're two of my heroes, but yeah. nevertheless, it's a very flimsy definition. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> began to occur to me that maybe these kind of relational networks, because Sergeant Janowitz has been talking about. Okay might be an avenue to, to formalize, to, to, to uh, reconceptualize the uh, idea of social disorganization in terms of uh, 
local social control. Looking back on it, come around full circle. Uh -huh. This apparently also, uh, in, and independently, was occurring to Rob Samson, uh, which has in, just prior to the '88 paper uh, of mine that you mentioned, yeah. the Robbins Prospects paper. Rob had published a wonderful paper, I think in ASR, it might have been J AJS, but I think it was ASR. It wasn't a crim paper, mm -hmm. but it was a paper on systemic urban structures. Oh. And prior to that, Rob had been doing criminology. So uh, he obviously also saw the potential okay. for the systemic thing. <clears throat> you know, so it's not anything I invented, for Christ's sakes. Yeah. Nobody, that independent invention thing is a bit of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, in '88, I, I put out the uh, the problems and prospects paper, which was which is real relative, and yeah. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but that was a theoretical exposition. Mm -hmm. You know, in '89, Rob, uh, in conjunction with Byron Groves, put out the '89 paper, where it first gets empirically tested. Okay, and that's what kicked it into gear. I, I'd like to say. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> but no, I, I had something to do with it, certainly. But the, uh, the Samson Groves 89 paper, that's what caught people's attention. Okay. Because not only did they, they uh, put forth a systemic model yeah. of this organization, but they could test it for the first time. But I think what the, the importance of the problems and prospects paper was, it was an honest, forthright account of why the the Chicago School had fallen into disrepair. Oh, yeah. So yeah. here it was just an assessment of where we need to plug in the gaps, and here's how we can extend the theory. Uh, yeah, I've always liked history. Uh, so, you know, it was fun yeah. digging into the history, because you know, you hear, you know, your, your, your 25 cent introduction to social disorganization will be Sean McKay, yeah. got the concept from, uh, uh, from Thomas, maybe for 50 cents you'll find out Park and Burgess were involved, <laughs> and then for some reason that's left unspecified, it disappeared. Yes. And that yeah. fascinated yeah. me because it was the big dog. Yeah. I mean, not only was it used to study crime, but it was used to study families and family disruptions, it was used to uh, study mental illness, yeah. all kinds of things, and then yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, I thought, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And I, I presented a paper the ASC meetings, I want to say 85, 86, okay. something like that, in which that, that history you know, was outlined. Okay. And, and the seeds of the prospects were in that. Okay. And then somebody suggested that that might be something that criminology was interested in, right. the journal. And so I, I worked on it, expanded the prospects thing, fleshed out the, the problems thing, and that's how it turned out to be what it is. You and I have talked about this privately. I, I, I think. I mean, there's been so many good trends in criminology, yeah. but one of the bad things is that our, our historical vision has shrunk. Yes. Yeah. So that, that especially for, for young criminologists, you know, if it was published more than five years ago, it's, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, which, which is sad for, for two reasons. One, a lot of the insights that, that the, our, our intellectual ancestors came up with yeah. are provocative as hell, are still unexplored, and are very promising. Yes. And two, on a more prosaic level, we often end up reinventing the wheel. Yeah. And when I, when I was editor of Crim, it used to drive me nuts. <laughs> you know, that you get this cover letter for a paper, for the first time ever we're going to do this. And I just said, no. <laughs> you know, and then I'd send back a little bibliography yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, remember so, doing, I remember doing the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, when you unveiled that. You, you yeah. quoted the Feinstone stuff. Yeah. And, and drew parallels to, to Elijah Anderson's work. Well, actually, it was Coburn like parallel. I drew, okay. from, I drew from Hal Feinstone, okay. who also was an actor. Yeah. Uh, but it was Coburn. Coburn, I picked. For a very selfish reason, I really there were a couple of ways I could have gone then. Yeah. But when people like me and Rob Sampson and Ralph Taylor, mm -hmm. and there were just a just a handful of us, yeah. starting to redo this kind of neighborhood work. Yeah. Uh, it was it, neighborhood work was being done in terms of programmatic issues. Okay. 
Uh, but in terms of theoretically driven criminology, it, yeah. it, it was gone. And we weren't well received initially. Yeah. Because we were doing throwback work that was irrelevant. And I remember it's one of my very first ASC presentations uh, where I mentioned, you know, people criticize this because it has an in, uh, doesn't have an individualistic orientation. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, the discussant gets up and slams his fist and says, well, you're damn right you get criticized for that. Yeah. The only way we know this stuff is through studies of individuals. <laughs> And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big theme in all of Jim Short's work, by yeah. the way. So that, that's not original with me either. Um, oh, uh, so anyhow, Coburn yeah. and to a lesser extent, Lyle Shannon, who was out at Iowa at that time. But Saul was really supportive of this stuff. And he was really encouraging us. And he was just a wonderful gentleman, a gentleman in the true sense of the word. Yeah. And uh, so for the Dead Sea thing, uh, that's why I sold the call. Uh, I chose salt. It was kind of a post-mortem thank you. Okay. Uh, for all the help he had given people like Ralph and Rob and, okay. and, and, and the others. And that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls is about, yeah. is to get off the computer, and I love computer, I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm a computer junkie, but get into the damn library and yeah. dig around. And that's where the Dead Sea analogy came from. So, what, to what do you do? So, the, to what do you attribute the eventual success <coughs> of the reemergence of the, the neo Chicago school? Then, oh shoot, uh, uh, the original Sean McCain one? No, the the, the new win that that you were part of with this, well, this collective of well you know, Taylor and they, Samson and well, especially with Samson, uh, yeah, especially with Rob, he showed one that it could be empirically studied. Okay. And two, that for the most part, its, pre its predictions were on target. Okay. Which, as, as a side note, I think is just impressive as hell because Sean McKay did just a little bit of statistical stuff. Okay. And I've seen it, seen the machines they use. They use those damn adding machines. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where you set aside a week to run a regression because you know yeah. the calculations were so yeah. so tedious, and with the advantage of, of of what at that time we thought were high speed computers, yeah. I mean, little did we know, Rob. So yeah, you know, despite despite those those primitive yeah. technological statistical approaches, yeah, they're they're on target. Okay, um, for that. I had done some earlier stuff before the 88 stuff in the disorganization mm -hmm. uh, tradition. <clears throat> but to do, for that to generate a big groundswell, it took a specialized set of data. I had, I had a long time series of right. data because of Sean McKay. Yeah. So I could do stuff. It was, it was equivalent to when John and, John and Rob found the book data. All right. uh, I was in a position that I don't think anybody else, with the possible except of Colburn, who was collecting stuff in L.A. at that yep. time, uh, that didn't really, it, it, it tweaked people's interests. Okay. Um, and, and some of it was very well received. Yeah. But boy, the Samson Groves paper, that turned it around. Okay. That, that, that was the case start. Huh. Now, now, when you look back on your career, what's, what are the contributions that you look back on with the most amount of pride? Terms of the contributions I've made? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Uh, well, the 88 Problems Prospects paper. Yeah. Although I, I, I look back, look back at now, and sometimes I cringe because, oh. well, you, you know, you, you always become a better writer. Yes. Yeah, and so I just cringe at some, some of the terminology I used okay. or the structure of the sentences. <laughs> so, some things uh, I should have said but didn't, you know, okay. blah, 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 blah. But yeah, that was a that was a very proud moment. The ninety three neighborhoods and yeah. crime book. Um, but I'm not. I mean, this this comes out of the out of the uh, uh, Dead Seas paper. Okay. Um, Peter Rossi, I just once heard say that you know, there's two oh, kinds yeah, of sociologists yeah. in the world. There's the elephants. There's the stars of the show. And then there's the sweepers who come behind the, the elephants and sweep up the shit, you know. <laughs> well, I'm a sweeper. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not an elephant, I'm a sweeper. And uh, I, I hope that I've swept to the degree that, that you know, elephants, the next elephants, you know, have a clean place to go and okay. maybe maybe the path is a little clear. All right. But it's, I can't really, other than those two things, I really can't pinpoint one certain thing. Okay. It's been kind of a steady, steady progression. Okay. Um, what, what would you say the, the current status of, of social disorganization is at this point? Oh, uh, that, now that's a, that's a good question yeah. that, that uh, I'm currently working a lot with my colleague Stephanie DiPietro. We've talked about this a lot. Jim Short and I talk about it a lot. Yeah. Rob and I have talked about it some, but we're, we're so far apart geographically. Sure. <clears throat> and, and he's so busy that we haven't been able to talk about it as much, much as I, I wish we could have. I think we're at a real important place in social disorganization. We're either at the place where the same thing that happened before is going to happen. Yeah. It's going to come to a standstill. Okay. And, and there are people, and people whose opinions I totally respect, think it's gone about as far as it's, it, it can go. Okay. Know, we went through the systemic period and then in a quick parlay into social capital and then now yeah. the collective efficacy thing. Yeah. Well, you know, the efficacy stuff, uh, brilliant contribution on Rob's part, which also shows <coughs> his Catholic training as a student, yeah. because that comes right out of, uh, out of psychology. Hmm. A collective efficacy is from educational psych, yeah. where you, you, know, you, you see if a class thinks they can conquer this material. Yeah. And Rob brilliantly adapted it. But now efficacy has been, been established. Okay. And so we're getting more and more papers demonstrating the relevance of collective efficacy. Okay. And I don't know how much farther okay. we can go unless there's some big breakthrough. Some of those breakthroughs, I think, have been anticipated by, by great work uh, ethnographically that people like Mary Patillo McCoy have done. Okay. Uh, Pat Carr has done a host of others who I'm leaving out, so no offense. <laughs> um, and some kind of intriguing, and I don't mean kind of intriguing, it's good work that Chris Browning at Ohio State oh, has been doing. Yeah. Um, because, in my opinion, yeah. the systemic model itself and its focus on networks and relationships and things like that mm -hmm. has never been tested. Mm -hmm. Samson Groves gave, gave a good start. But they focused only on one aspect of, of networks, and that was how many people do you know? Okay. And everything since then uh, is some variant of how many people you know. Okay. And things like that. All right. Um, that's a, a, a very minor part of a network. But that's what networks have become associated with. Okay. What I'm, in fact, during these meetings, what Stephanie and I are going to be arguing. <clears throat> is that we've never really done a network study of, of neighborhood crime uh -huh. where you can look at uh, reciprocated friendship choices and those through those networks you know resources are exchanged yeah. so I don't think that 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 Browning's arguments about reciprocated exchanges mm -hmm. is at all a contradiction of the systemic model it's okay. a different dis dimension okay. of what a network does uh, likewise, the arguments that he and Patia McCoy make about uh, negotiated coexistence. Mm -hmm. I think that's great systemic support. Yeah. Uh, we just haven't been able to measure that. Okay. And so now we're kind of in the same position, I think. Yeah. Rob may, may, may say something completely different. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we're at the point that Sean McKay got when they couldn't measure social disorganization. Okay. Either we're really going to have to get into the guts of networks All right. or they're going to become a, something of historical interest of contemporary irrelevance and we'll start with collective efficacy, efficacy and go from there. That may be where it goes. I just think we're, we're pre a lot and a lot of people have rejected, are starting to reject the systemic network. Okay. Thing. I think the rejection is premature. Now, are, are those data limitations, methodological limitations, or theoretical limitations? They're not theoretical or? limitations. They are data methodological limitations. Okay. <clears throat> to study a network, you have to have a finite population with, okay, neighborhoods have a finite population. Okay. Um, and you have to have a matrix, a huge matrix, mm -hmm. 
of the relationship of each possible dyad okay. in that in that neighborhood. All right. That's impossible. Huh. That, that's what has to be done, but that's impossible to to uh, to generate. You know, depending what city you're on, your neighborhood could have six thousand people on it. Okay. So that just one neighborhood would take six thousand interviews. Who do you hang with? That, okay. And then you can trace the negotiated coexistence and okay. the, the uh, reciprocated exchanges and so forth. All right. And so I wasn't really, really optimistic. All right. Saying, geez, maybe I should be a historical criminologist. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I saw what had happened in the area of peer groups. All right. In, yeah. my, in my opinion, <clears throat> and this is only my opinion. All right. I think the peer group body of work had faced the same problems that the disorganization body of work had faced, mm -hmm. in the sense that there were lots of studies of peer group members, but not of peer groups themselves. Okay. Just like we had a lot of studies of, of network members, All right. but not of the networks themselves. Okay. And so after a, a while, a lot of the peer group stuff got repetitive. Right. Uh, you'd see fewer and fewer papers being presented on it, fewer okay. and fewer papers being published. New uh, theoretical and substantive insights were really few and far between until Ad Health came along. All right. And Ad Health just kicked it in the butt. Yeah. And the stuff being done with peer groups now is spectacular. Yeah. Just spectacular. And here's how, here's how they did it. It was a huge study. Well, a couple hundred high schools, you know, was their fam sampling frame. But they took 16 of those high schools okay. and interviewed everybody. All right. Everybody in those high schools. All right. And they were able, if you said, uh, yeah, you know, my, my best friend here in, in school is, uh, is uh, uh, Floyd Vaughn. All right. They can see, did Floyd mention you? Yes. And it does that for up to five male friends and up to five female friends. And the network stuff that's coming out of that is yep. spectacular. So here's where I think, at least the systemic model has a future. It will have, they call it, Ad Health called it a saturated sample. Okay. He interviewed everybody. All right. We're gonna have to change our focus from large-scale communities, get away from census tracts, okay. even get away from face block, or from block groups, and focus on face blocks, which Ralph Taylor has been arguing for 20 years, okay. that face block is the unit of analysis. Huh. <clears throat> and then do saturated, saturated surveys of a selection of face blocks. Okay. Now that'd be expensive as hell, yeah. but it's certainly feasible. Like I, I checked actually just before we came out here. My face block as of 2010 has 250 people. So that would be 250 interviews, mm -hmm. okay, or 250 people over the age of 18. Okay. So that's 250 interviews. Okay, we've got a face block. Well, you could do 20 of those, and then you're up to like a sample size of 4,000 interviews. All right. The trick would be, oh, you do 30 and you're up to 6,000. And what's Rob got in the in uh, Chicago. He's up to 8,000, so that'd be, what, 40 face blocks. And the trick would be how you select the plate, the face blocks to saturate. Okay. And there's, you know, you could do it, you know, on a strictly random basis. I, I, I think that wouldn't be very productive. But you could stratify along some dimension. Okay. Let's say if you stratified your face blocks into four levels of crime rates, yeah. you know. And then just chose ten, a random thing of ten blocks from each of those categories. Okay. And then saturated, did the saturated study. That's that's where I think we're headed. Okay. If not, yeah. Uh, we've always got ethnography. The ethnographic yes. insights yeah. Yeah. are spectacular. Yeah. Uh, some people are starting to, and again, strictly because of data problems. John Hip has started to experiment with the use of simulations. Uh, we, you simulate the networks. Okay. And simulations are good, but you know, it's fake data. 
Okay. And the data are generated under some assumptions. Uh -huh. And if those assumptions are reasonable and persuasive, then you can learn all kinds of good stuff from, from simulated data. Okay. Uh, Kent Boulding made incredible contributions in economics on the basis of simulated data. Mm -hmm. To date, uh, the working papers I've seen that are doing simulation stuff, I'm not comfortable with the generating assumptions okay. um, yeah. for a variety of reasons. So that's one possibility. Okay. The other possibility is doing something called network sampling. Right. where uh, you, you've got the, the person you're interviewing, so it's an egocentric thing, and you ask about their friends, and then ask them about the relationships among the people that they've, they've mentioned. Okay. So it's kind of step back. All right. And you know, it's, it's kind of like the problems that peer group studies had when, when you ask them, well, how delinquent are your friends? Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of self-projection. Sure. And, and so forth. So I, I personally think possibly the simulation studies. Okay. Possibly. But I'm thinking the saturated stuff and the ethnographic stuff is the future of the kind of neighborhood studies that I do. Okay. If not, I'm gonna be a damn historical criminal. <laughs> <laughs> or it could it could just repeat the cyclical process what yeah, where you know where it lies dormant and then at some point but what, what, you know, and that's that's very true. Yeah. But if it does reemerge and, and things go in cycles. Like sure. That, um, you know, strain theory, in fashion, out of fashion, yeah. in fashion. Yeah. After Kornhauser, with the exception of a few stalwarts like Ron Akers and Ross, Ross Matsueta and Karen Heimer, some cultural approaches went out, yeah. out, yeah. out of the fat. Yeah. And now they're back. Yeah. I don't know if it's strong as ever, but you sure have a whole lot of work that's been guided by Elijah Anderson's insights. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there is that cyclical thing. What you want to hope, though, <coughs> is that as it cycles, it doesn't go like this. You want it to go like this. Yeah. So it's progressive yeah. improvement. Yeah. yeah. So. Now, looking back on your career here and sort of advice to the future generations, thinking about uh, maybe missteps or things that maybe you did right, though, uh, advice to, to those who are interested in pursuing a career in criminology and being successful at it. Well, th that's an interesting, interesting question because there's some, some disciplinary changes sure. that's going yes. on. And increasingly, I, I feel like like an old fart curmudgeon. <laughs> All right. Uh, the biggest advice I, I could give a young criminologist is to make sure what you're doing is important. Yeah. There always has been this this very tenuous balance. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, for criminologists in academia, uh, when you come up for tenure or promotion to a full professor. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you weigh quality versus quantity? Yeah. That's always been a yeah. tough, tough question. Yeah. Well, over recent years, I'd say, especially in the last 10 years, the scale has really moved in the direction of quantity. Yeah. Part of this is heresy. <laughs> Part of this, I think, is due to the US News and World Report rankings, okay. which certainly have benefited my department a lot. Yeah. You know, we, we've got a very, very good ranking. But a key part of that ranking is based on number of publications. Sure. And so you see people who over the course of a year maybe publish, you know, 10, 15, even more in the course of a year. Yeah. When and they're 10 or 15 okay papers. Yeah. When they could have been three spectacular papers. Yeah. Uh it just seems to me people aren't taking the time to really percolate the ideas mm -hmm. and take the time to do the Dead Sea Scroll stuff yeah. and learn not only from what we've done in the past, but what other disciplines are doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, shit, system, pardon me. <laughs> the systemic model came out of urban social. Collective efficacy came out of psychology. All right. uh, uh, much of feminist criminology came out of gender studies. Okay. Uh, much of, uh, in the subject of Ruth's talk last night, much of the current work in race and crime is based in race and ethnicity studies, yeah. written broadly. Yeah. And I, I percolate yeah. 
make make it important. Yeah. Uh, we had we had. So I'll do this discreetly. We were hiring this year, and some of the applicants we had as grad students had incredible publication records. Mm -hmm. I mean, publication records that in the old days you would expect of somebody going on up for a full professor. Yeah. But really, was, but you read the papers, and you know, it's just, well, I'm going to add this new variable here. Okay. Or, you know, I'm going to make this little tweak there. So okay. I'd advise you get your tweaking done <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and publish this stuff. <laughs> Some people can publish a lot. Rod, Rob Samson is incredibly productive. Yeah. I, on the other hand, write very slowly. Yeah. Uh, Rob's papers, without exception, are really high quality. Some people can pull that off. Yeah. But I think it takes a very special kind of person to pull that off. Huh. Uh, so my advice <laughs> would definitely be quality first. I mean, okay. quantity is, is important, but quality is the key. Now, the, when thinking about the development of criminology, into its own entity here. Mm -hmm. You have some experience with this, having been trained in sociology yeah. and one of the better sociology programs uh, that ever was. <laughs> uh, do you have some concerns about uh, the ability to draw from these other fields now that we're more self-contained? One of my, again, when I was editor, yeah, and again, this this a cohort difference. So, you know, the way that I had been trained as opposed to to. The newer generation. The, the newer generation. It became apparent that more and more people were learning about things only from other criminologists. Okay. So, for example, if a neighborhood paper came into the journal, yeah. the only people you see cited were criminologists. Okay. Or if a race paper came into the journal, only criminologists would, would be. Mm -hmm. So it's become a lot more insular, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. than it used to be. Whether that's good or bad is a matter of opinion. I think it's not good. Okay. Uh, because there's some great stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you an interesting story in that regard. Back when I was in Oklahoma, we were, we were interviewing uh, for a social position, but it was a person trained in criminology. Mm -hmm. And that person, uh, and I have to be discreet here. That person was using a, a very popular criminological theory yeah. and involving the family and did a very, very good job of how criminologists treated that thing. Yeah. And when that person was done with the interview, and we all got together to debrief, yeah. we had three really good family sociologists on the faculty, and they were absolutely aghast <laughs> because according to them, and I trusted yeah. them implicitly, what they had heard was like 20 years behind the times uh, of what was going actually, where the action was in family social. Uh, uh, and that bothers me. Okay. Th that bothers me. We've had those calls forever. Um, Wayne Osgood. Oh, stealing from your friends. Stealing from your yeah. friends. Jim Short had, had a presidential address in which that was part of, part okay. of the key. I mean that stuff is there. Yeah. Uh, not using it is is just a terrible oversight. Okay. And sometimes leads to unfortunate results. Well, it's more about the reinventing the wheel kind of thing. <coughs> it, it's reinventing the wheel, yeah. but it's also being unaware. Yeah. There's that. Uh, yes. Of uh, yeah. Some great insights that have been made. So. Yeah. Um, is that curmudgeonly enough for you? It, yeah, I think, I think that's really good to spot. I, I, share, I share many of your opinions and just sort of okay. uh, uh, reflecting on sort of our agreement yeah. here in terms of uh, the state of the field. Now, when you look at, out at the state of the field, uh, what do you think its, its overall health is in terms of its intellectual bona fides and where it might, oh, where, it, you might where you might see the field in 10 to 15 years? That's an interesting question because the field has exploded. Yes. One of the reasons feels, because you know, criminology goes in and out of fashion. Yeah. But now with these economic times, uh, there's not a lot left, but there's more criminology funding left yeah. than if you were studying the sociology of religion, okay. for example. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, whereas historically, 
we've been a real low status substantive very at least in criminology yeah there was always a big tension there even even in chicago now there's there's more of an appreciation but for very pragmatic reasons all right criminologists draw the students yes uh i was talking to someone last night who's in a mixed department well actually she's in a social department that mm -hmm. has a good good crim component and about a third of the faculty are criminologists and they generate two-thirds of the credit hours all right so you know they need us yeah uh in terms of external funding they need us yeah it's a little too late, <laughs> but I, I'm concerned about the, the, the intellectual vitality. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't want us to move to the point that we're doing piecework. Oh, all right. You know, just okay. production for the sake of production. All right. Uh, I want it to remain thoughtful. Yeah. Um, and, and there's some really provocative stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But you know, and it's like when uh, if you took an exam and you got a ninety-eight on it, yeah. and all you can think about are those two points that you missed, you forget the fact you got the ninety-eight. <laughs> but those two points are bugging you. Yeah, that's kind of like me. I, you know, this, this good stuff in in all kinds of fields in criminology, but it's the number for number's sake that okay. I keep noticing. All right. So I hope that goes away. Okay. If I had my druthers, heresy alert. The U.S. News and World Report would go away. I, I would yeah. just as soon see them go away. Okay. So that, that departments were not competing to get high rankings on that. And again, that's really hypocritical of me to say it because sure. my department has benefited sure. a lot from it. Yeah. Nevertheless, I'd, I'd like to see us go back to days when we fought about quality. All right. You know, rather than, than okay. just the numbers. All right. Um. Any parting thoughts before we uh, conclude? I want to thank you for your time. Oh, you shoot, it's my contribution pleasure. here. Um, no, this is a. Uh, uh, I'm very honored you asked me to come talk. Um, you know, I've been part of this association for. Oh shoot, what is it? Over thirty years. I joined when I was ten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you with a. a, a well, oh, I had to I had to be here. Then, uh, this is a, a great society. I, I, I have deep attachments to the society. Um, I just want people to think a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, forget about ten papers a year. Do four. All right. Because I thought of it. You know, this ten papers a year. That means you spend a month per paper. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's your reading. That's your cogitating. <laughs> that's your model fitting. Reminding. That's the considering. You know. Sure. Think a little <laughs> bit longer, you know. It, you know, the fact that you've got eleven papers instead of ten publications. Okay. All right. Pardon me. <laughs> doesn't mean shit to me. <laughs> I want to see the contribution. All right. That, that's what I would say. One, one last parting shot from the curmudgeon criminology. <laughs> <laughs> then no, I don't want to leave on a down note because you know I've been looking at some great stuff that you've sure. done here. Yeah. Uh, there are some young criminologists that I wish I was. There are some grad students, not well, advanced grad students I've heard present that I, I wish I had uh, the abilities that, that they're displaying. There's a great future here. Yeah. I don't want to see, see it turn into a business. Oh, all right. I don't like the business model. Okay. I like, I'm a, I'm a kid of the 60s, I like policy stuff. Yeah. I'm not a policy guy. But I hope the stuff that I do has relevance, okay. you know, for the policy. Right. The policy's got to be based on important ideas. Yeah. You know, it's not based on should I lag this twice or should I take the square root transformation. All right. So, All right. That curmudgeonly enough. That, I think that 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 fits. <laughs> All right. Okay. That it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.